In the last few months, I worked on an unusually big project. Using this project, I'll show you tools and tricks you can use for your projects. Maybe you find something you did not know? Please post your experiences or browse through the comments to learn from the most knowledgeable viewers on the Internet. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. This spring, I started a project to talk to another guy with a Swiss accent in Antarctica via a geostationary satellite. And yes, we were able to talk to each other. If you are interested in the project, feel free to watch the videos. The link to the playlist is in the upper right corner. But today we will focus on the materials, tools and tricks used for the build. Things we will cover are how to power such a project and how to wire it. Assemble many modules which do not fit on a PCB. Power the project which needs several different voltage levels. Select an outdoor case big enough to fit the whole project. Connect the internals of the box with the external components without letting too much humidity in. Monitor and switch it on and off remotely. Provide easy access to all parts. I'm sure it will be enhanced over time or has to be repaired. Let's start with the case because in the end it defines the dimensions of the overall project. Of course, the parts also influence the size of the box. I suggest using a bigger box because it will make things easier later. There are many possibilities for the box itself. Professional ones that last forever but cost a ton of money and cheaper ones that probably will die earlier. Projects and desires of makers change over time and the chance that the project is enhanced or no more used in a few years is high, at least with me. So I decided to use this transparent box from the local do-it-yourself store. The top has a ceiling which should keep humidity out. Maybe the content will also help to solve this problem because it will dissipate some power. Transparent is always nice because it is easy to do a visual check. And if the proud maker wants to show off, it is also useful. Its price here in Switzerland was around $25. I'm sure you have other solutions, so feel free to share them. What's next? The project has seven main modules which form a transceiver to receive a 10 GHz signal and transmit up to 20 watts on 2.4 GHz. And it needs some power rails. 24 to 28 volts for the power amplifier. A few amperes are needed. I usually overdimension my power supplies because first, the Chinese manufacturers usually exaggerate. Second, the power supply is usually a cheap part compared with the more valuable rest. If it fails, everything fails or is destroyed. 12 volts for the preamplifiers, the frequency generator and the cooling fan for the power amplifier. All in all, around 1 ampere. But the fan created problems when switched on and off. So I separated its rail from the rest using a second power supply. 5 volts for the Adalm Pluto and SDR transceiver. These three power rails have to be switched because the station will not always be on. A 5 volt rail for a VMOS D1 mini setup which has to be always on because it switches the other rails and monitors temperature and humidity. Like that, I can get three different alarms. If the box loses power, something is entirely wrong. If it reports high humidity, the case did not work as expected and there is still hope that the fast intervention can save the expensive modules. If it reports high temperatures, it's not good for the valuable parts. I also want to collect data about the heat in outdoor boxes for other projects. The final setup has five power rails, one times 24 volts, two times 12, and two times five volts. We have defined all the needed modules and rails. 
all the radio parts were known from my initial test and were not changed. The power section, however, is entirely new. I decided to use a concept used in professional equipment but adapted it to a maker's possibilities. To separate the active components and the power rails. The best solution probably would be a metal sheet for mounting and shielding between the two parts. Because I'm not equipped for metalwork, I used wood instead. The top side is populated with the active components and the bottom is used to create the power rails. There is one exception. This volt ampere meter is on the top because I want to see it from the outside. To get the needed clearance, I printed four feet and mounted them with screws. Screws still are a reliable method for that. And if you do it like that, mounting is easy because the nut stays where it should. If you want, you can add a little superglue, which works well with PLA. I also added four holes and two cords. Like that, I can remove the whole setup easily. We will continue with the power rails because most projects will need one or more of them. Many variants exist. You can create each rail from mains. Or create a lower voltage from mains and boost it to the needed higher levels. Or create the highest voltage from mains and reduce it for the lower voltage levels. Three things are essential for such decisions. First, which component and rail consumes most of the power? Second, transporting higher voltages is easier because we need less current and thinner wires, smaller switches and connectors. At least if we stay below 50 volts. Third, the decision on which rails have to be switched. For this project, the biggest consumer is the power amplifier. So I choose a switching power supply from mains to 24 volts. If needed, I can pimp it up to 27 volts to get more output power on 2.4 GHz. For the moment, 24 volts is OK. As said, I want to switch the whole radio on and off remotely. If I source all radio rails from the 24 volts rail, I only need one relay. Let's continue with a 24 volt power supply. I have many different power supplies in my lab, but I only had one for 24 volts. And it happens to deliver 8.5 ampere maximum. For sure too much. Maybe I will change it in the future for a smaller one. For the moment it fits because I choose a bigger case. Now we come to materials and other tricks. How do I connect cables to these screw terminals, for example? I once bought an assortment of those naked terminals. They are much better than the ones used for cars. I hope naked is not yet banned like males and females for connectors or master and slave for I2C. The car terminal insulation does not fit after crimping. With naked terminals, you can add heat shrink tube. This looks much better. I use ferrules for the terminals on the regulator because they look nice and can easily be inserted and removed. You get them assorted too, but their color is according to their size. Not nice. This is why I bought a bunch of black and red ones. Now the ferrules fit the colors of the wires. Someone should say that makers are not ease feeds. And I completely switched to using silicon wires. They are more flexible and never melt during soldering. By the way, you find links to all parts shown in the description below. Because the difference between 24 and 12 or even 5 volts is significant, the best solution is to use switching regulators. And because I want to keep the possibility to go up to 27 volts, they have to support at least 30 volts input voltage. The current is not a big issue because most of the switchers supports more than one ampere output current. I selected this one from my drawer because it is the only that supports up to 36 volts. I want to separate the rail for the fan from the rail from the rest. Why? Frequent viewers know that I fried my first power amplifier because I did not pay attention. An expensive error that lasts in memory. This is why I added the fan. In general, fans are not the most durable parts. 
so I only want to run it if needed. Such a thermal switch is the most simple and cheapest way to achieve this. You get them for different temperatures and normally on or normally off. And the best, they support up to 16 amperes. I choose one for 45 degrees. After that, the fan starts to cool the amplifier. So I choose a normally open type. I could add a second normally close switch for 80 degrees, for example, and insert it in the amplifier's power line. It would protect the amplifier and switch it off at 80 degrees. Luckily, the sensor fitted between the hot surface and the fan. The only thing you have to pay attention to is that the switch's case is connected to one of the wires and you create a short. To avoid this, you get ceramic versions or you use captain tape to insulate the metal version. Captain tape, by the way, should be in all labs. It is heat resistant and therefore very versatile. With this solution, my amplifier is safe from overheating and the 12 volt devices are safe from any peaks when the fan switches. But how to distribute power to the many modules? I did not want to have fixed wires. Maybe in the future I will go this direction and add such long terminals. They are on order. For the moment I still want to be able to disconnect the modules from power. This is why I decided to go with power poles. Not the cheapest way, but I had this distribution box in my lab. These power poles are easy to connect and remove and can carry a lot of current. If you do not know these power pole connectors, I introduced them in mailbag video number 350. Another possibility could have been to use XT60 plugs widely used for RC planes. This would definitely be cheaper, but maybe a little harder to unplug. The 5V rail could be derived from the 24V rail, because the chosen 5V regulator has 24V maximum input voltage, I connect it to the 12V rail. And I want to show you a variant to protect it, heat shrink tube and hot glue. In addition to the assorted small heat shrink tubes for wires, I also have wider ones from 10 to 40 mm in diameter. Like that I can select a fitting one to protect small boards like this one. Such tubes shrink their size to about half. The cables here are much thinner and would not be protected by such a big tube. This is why I insert hot glue into both ends before I shrink the tube. Please pay attention that you do not fill too much glue because the tube immediately shrinks and pushes it out. Over time you will learn how much is needed. After that I shrink the rest with my hot air gun. I use this quick station. This is one of the best choices I made for the lab. In just a few seconds it is heated to the right temperature. Recently I found even bigger tubes for battery packs. They are not transparent, but useful for even bigger things. Staying with heat shrink tubes. If you want to connect two cables, you get these special tubes with a blob of solder in the middle. You insert the two cables and then heat the whole thing to a high temperature. I use 400 degrees. Then the solder inside the tube starts to melt and connects the wires. And these orange parts should seal the connection from water. An excellent addition to my lab. I forgot something, the volt and ampermeter. I always have a few of them in my lab. They are very helpful to debug and monitor your projects. And the best, they are dirt cheap and accurate enough for most purposes. I once made cool boxes using such meters. You should see the link to video number 197 in the upper right corner. The printed case is based on a Universal Fusion 360 design, shown in video number 258. You just enter the three dimensions, add the openings where needed and print it. A piece of cake. The last component is the remote switch. I could have used a ready-made module, but this time I decided on the VMOS shields. I added an ESP8266, a relay and a prototype shield for the I2C connection to the temperature and humidity sensor. Initially I also used a power shield which is rated for 24 volts input. 
unfortunately, it did not survive. Another example of not using too tightly specified Chinese modules. This shield system is handy for such applications. The Wemos, by the way, runs Tasmota. And because the HDC 1080 sensor is not supported in any standard release, I had to create my own. Using their tools, it was not too complicated. But it has a learning curve. I also lost a lot of time because one of my boards had a bad solder joint. Shit happens. But how to mount all the modules to the wooden plate? I assume I will not change the power components. This is why I use double-sided tape from Aldi. If the module's surface is not flat, I add more than one layer until it sticks. Simple and cheap. It is also no catastrophe if one detaches after a while. I want the top components removable. This is why I use those hook and loop fastener tapes. An invention by another guy with a Swiss accent. More massive modules like this power supply are conventionally mounted with screws. Here I have a secret to share. I use such a wow stick to screw and unscrew. But I was never happy because it is not strong enough. Recently I bought this little toy from Bosch. Ugly but powerful. I love it. I only use it with bits, not for drilling. Because it is so small, it fits my drawer like the other screwdrivers. Next are fuses. It is good practice to use a few fuses in projects like that. It can save you money if something goes wrong. The 12 volt distributor already has fuses, so I only added one for the power amplifier. If you order such fuse holders, pay attention that you get the ones with a lot of copper in the cable, not like this one, which is mainly plastic. And order an assortment of glass fuses with different values. They are also handy for the other devices in your household. For higher currents, you can also use these holders for car fuses. Another insider tip is ferrite beads, which are used in USB or laptop power cables. They dampen high frequencies on those cables. A simple and effective way to remove unwanted frequencies. It is never wrong to add those to your power lines, primarily if you work with switching power supplies. You get them for different diameters. I added a few of them here and there. Now we have a working satellite ground station. But it has to be connected to 220 volts, to Ethernet and of course to three antennas. To make sure not too much moisture is entering the box, I use such IP68 cable glands. They come in several sizes to fit the diameter of the cables. Pay attention that you mount the connectors only after you inserted the cables. Otherwise they will not pass the small hole. My project needs Ethernet and coax cables. Especially the coax cables come with the SMA connectors attached. This is why I used larger glands and will wrap some tape around the cable when finished. Not the nicest thing, but fortunately not visible inside this protector. How to drill these big holes? With a step drill of course. Also a vital tool in my lab. So everything is ready to be mounted on the roof. A last video in the Q0100 series will come covering my experience with the radio part. I hope you found one or the other hint for your projects. Or you tell me that you do things much easier or much better than I did. As always you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.